Welcome to another Healing Oracle update. I'm Robert J. Morris, and the following is a recap of an interview conducted in May 2016 with a patient of ours named Sarah. She managed to cure herself of cancer utilizing the tools and knowledge attained from Amanda Mary Jewell during her process at La Flor de la Salud. That's in Puebla, Mexico. To begin with, we'll start with a reference video um, and some shorts that were taken during the month of their initial stay in 2016. And then we'll follow up with the interview that I just conducted this year in January. All right, everybody, we're here with Sarah and Simon. Uh, how are you guys doing today? Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what we're doing here today is just to talk about uh, your experience since you got here. Now, what date did you guys arrive? God, I don't know, it was a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's all gone so fast. The um, 10th, the 10th of May. 10th of May, yeah. The 10th of May. You're right, it does go by quick. Yeah. Um, so, so that's about two weeks. Uh, how has the uh, the overall, uh, I guess you could say, je ne sais quoi, how, how has it been here at, at the clinic since you guys arrived? I know there was a bit of a toss-up at the beginning. Uh, accommodations. Yeah, accommodations, yeah, accommodations yeah. moving from one to the other but aside from all that no, how, how have you found it brilliant yeah i think everybody's been really friendly and they yeah very well um, and the kids are enjoying themselves yeah you know he was Kid, he looked after brilliantly. kids are entertained yeah, yeah <laughs> so it's going to be a struggle because we have a four-year-old and a three-month-old so mm, yeah, I can yeah see. so it's extra, it's extra isn't it you know because uh, i'm three months making sure that they've got stuff to do well it's good that there's two of you yeah, <laughs> and yeah, you got some help here as well yeah, yeah. definitely yeah. yeah so let's talk about your condition sarah um what what was it i understand you were pregnant when you were diagnosed with breast cancer i was i was 16 weeks pregnant so about four months pregnant and um I'd noticed that I'd had a lump before I fell pregnant and the doctors had said not to worry about it, it was just a lumpy breast and something instinctively made me go and get a second opinion so I went to the doctors again and they referred me through to a specialist clinic, they did further tests and they came back with the news that yes it was indeed um, a grade 2 carcinoma, ductal carcinoma, so yeah, two, mm. two lumps they found in my breast. Wow. And um, so from then to now, like, I guess, how, how many months has it been? Nine um, months. About nine, eh? Yeah. Wow. So how had that progressed? Because you've only been here two weeks, so... So when I found out, um, everything from the NHS's point of view was very quick. They wanted to um, have me in operate. Their recommendation was to do an operation, to do a mastectomy, and to do that in say like I think it was about five days from when I was actually speaking with them in five days time and so I went in the following day for a pre um, what's it called the pre-assessment for your operation see if you're fit enough to have an operation so I went and had all of that done mm. and they said that um, yeah that was fine not a problem but I still needed to go back and give consent and I still wasn't 100% sure I was doing the right thing because obviously my main concern was keeping the baby safe um, mm -hmm. And it just didn't it just didn't sit right with me. Um, I'd always known that I wouldn't do chemotherapy and radiation because I've known that the risks associated to that and how I think it's you know um, effectively poisoning yourself to get well again. It doesn't make sense it's to not me. Not logical. So yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It wasn't something that I ever wanted to do, but I was a bit unsure as to whether or not I might have the mastectomy just to get the tumors away from me, and then I would heal myself. But I decided that it seems rational at the time, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. It's like a time bomb, and you want it away from you, yeah, so yeah. it doesn't go off inside of you. Um, but I had my baby to think about, and I didn't want to put my baby in any unnecessary danger. You know, it's a very right. fierce bond between a mother and their child, whether they're in their womb or they're running yeah. around. So um, yeah, I based my decisions on on the safety of my child, really, and. Um, when I spoke to the anesthetist guy who talked about whether or not they would be able to monitor the baby to make sure the baby was safe, they kind of said that they wouldn't monitor the baby, they would just monitor me. I knew that the baby wasn't at a viable age, so there would be no intervention, the baby would just miscarry. Then he went on to talk about an analogy of, if, it, if I were a dog... Whoa. <laughs> yeah, if I yeah, were... <laughs> If it was a dog, I think he said that um, 
the dog would know that it could go on and have further pups, so it would miscarry its pups. And I'm sat there thinking, why on earth are you turning this into an analogy of a dog? <laughs> this is me and my baby. <laughs> That's horrible. So, yeah. Um, but it was at that point where I just thought, no one's looking out for my baby here. And I just thought, I, it's too much of a risk. I just can't, t you know, if, if I'd have gone through the operation and woken up and they had said, I'm sorry, Sarah, but you lost the baby, then I almost knew that the cancer probably would have killed me because of the grief of losing the baby. Yeah. And I just knew that I couldn't do that. I just couldn't do it. And right. So here we are. We're back with Simon and Sarah, who visited the La Flor de la Salud uh, clinic in Mexico, in Puebla, and uh, they were with us for an extended period of time due to, well, I might as well let Sarah explain the story, and uh, would you like to uh, introduce yourself, Sarah? Hi, Robert. Hi. Yeah, I'm Sarah, and um, yeah, I came to the clinic um, back in, I think it was May 2016, mm -hmm. uh, so a little while back now, and we we were we were only due to come for three weeks for the three week program. And we ended up staying for four weeks because I needed extensive dental treatment. So, um, they just couldn't get it done in the three weeks. So we had to stay for an extension for another week. I think it was. Yeah. Right. Now you were there, uh, being treated for breast cancer. Now, do you want to kind of go through the little story of what happened when you first found out about it? Okay. So um, I was four months pregnant at the time. Um, I kind of, I'd felt a lump before I even fell pregnant, um, but it was one of those things. I, I actually went to the doctor and I kind of got them to check it out and they said, oh, it's probably just, um, it's probably nothing. It doesn't feel sinister. It's, you know, come back in, say, three weeks, four weeks time and we'll have another feel and see what we think. That was just a local GP. Right. And so, um so I kind of left it, and I, I, I don't know, I wasn't really worried about it. Well, I was to begin with, and then when they had said that to me, it kind of calmed my nerves, and I thought, oh, okay, so they don't think it's anything, so maybe it isn't. And then it's so difficult to get an appointment. You have to, like, if, if you're going to make an appointment for a month's time, it's, it's really difficult. They're like, oh, well, you can only do it, like, in, like, say, two or three weeks' time, and so then it became, became a bit of a palaver, so I just kind of left it for a bit. Right. And then... And then uh, and then I fell pregnant, and that was fantastic news for us. We've been trying for some time, and so then it kind of, my focus was more on, oh, I'm pregnant now, rather than, oh, I have a lump in my breast, you know, mm -hmm. because it already said it was anything sinister. So anyway, I, I, when I was pregnant, I, I don't know what it was, whether it was an instinctive thing or whether it was a nesting thing. I was just kind of going through my to-do list of things I needed to just do before the baby came. Right, And so um, one of those things was, oh, maybe have another checkup at the doctor's just so that they can tell me that, oh, actually, that's fine. There's nothing to worry about. So um, I went to another um, GP within the same practice and she said to me, oh, it doesn't feel sinister. She said the same thing. She said, however, she said, I've had this happen before personally. And she said that she was going to refer me to the specialist breast care unit so that um, – they could just confirm either way um, what it was because she said, oh, because you're just worried um, if, it, if it stays there. So, you know, if we send you there, then they can tell you either way. She goes, but I'm not worried about it. Right. So then I, so then I, I, so then I was referred through and then they made an appointment and, um, and actually I canceled the appointment, I think, cause we had family come down and then, <laughs> so it was a, a long winded drawn out thing. And then unfortunately our cat died and that was horrendous. Oh, my. <laughs> I know. So then I think then I had the appointment like a – and then I had the appointment like a – no, actually, I think I had the appointment before the cat died. Sorry. I'm going on. And then um, only a few days before, and then the cat died. And then I went back seven days later, I think it was, and then I was actually diagnosed with breast cancer. I was like, what is going on in this world? Wow, well, when it rains, it pours, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Everything just kept coming at us, you know. So um, – yeah. Uh, so at that point, I was four months pregnant. I'd been diagnosed with um, uh, what was it? Um, ductal carcinoma. Invasive ductal carcinoma is the actual diagnosis. Right. And uh, they'd said there were two lumps there, 
and they had said that they'd had their multidisciplinary meeting and they decided that what they wanted to do was remove the entire breast because of where it was. They said it would become the breast, what would have been left over would have been a bit deformed. All right. Uh, the whole cut it out uh, technique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So because of that, they wanted to just take the entire breast away. And then they, so they talked about how they would book me to do that. I think I was diagnosed, it was the 19th of August and it was a Wednesday. And that was in 2005. No, sorry, 2015. Right. And then they had, um, then they had said, well, we can book you in next Friday for the operation. So, you know, that's really no time at all, is it? And really. And then they had sort of talked about how, you know, once that had happened, I would then see an oncologist and they would discuss chemotherapy and radiation with me. Right. Um, I went away a little bit shell-shocked of, oh, my God, I'm pregnant. And, and, so, uh, and, and with your pregnancy in the balance, sorry to cut you off, but with your pregnancy in the balance, what were their uh, concerns and advice in that regard? They, It was weird. They didn't really... They didn't really, I don't focus on the baby. They just kept focusing on me. And then they were talking about, they did, they talked about how I needed to think of the bigger picture, how I already had a four year old and um, I needed to think about that. And I thought, well, I already have a four year old, but yeah, I, I also have a baby in my tummy, you know, just because I'm pregnant is still to me, it's a baby, you know, right? Because I'm it's only four months old, it's still my child. So, I was a bit uncomfortable about it, and then I went back for the. I, I decided that I would go away, and I would think long and hard, and I would try and make an informed choice, and I would weigh up all the options, and I would, like, even make a list of all the pros and cons of actually having it done against not having it done. Right. And so I had the pre-assessment, which is where they see whether or not you're fit enough for an operation. And when I went into that, they weighed me, they asked lots of questions, they did my blood pressure, um, all things like that. And I remember that appointment or, or just when we were leaving that appointment, I just came over really, really emotional and I just had this feeling, this instinctive feeling to run as fast as I could away from that hospital. And, you know, I was like, what am I doing in here? This is not right. This is not right. And I just, and from that moment, I think that that's what helped me make the decision of I can't do this. Because at that appointment, I'd also asked to speak with an, an what are they called? Anaesthetist. Thank you. <laughs> I asked to talk to him because um, I wanted to know who would be looking after the baby during the operation. Right, and naturally. I yeah. can. I could never say that word either. No. <laughs> I don't know, I'll manage that. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, so when I spoke with him, you know, we, we talked at length about, you know, who, who would monitor me, what were the chances, you know, how many people that are pregnant have operations, have big operations, you know, um, what are the statistics around, you know, is that a good idea? And so he kind of did this thing where he kind of made this analogy of how if I were a dog, I would have, um, I, if, if I were to lose the pup, I'd go on to have. What was it he said? I'd go on. Well, he just said the body knows how to react. So if it felt that it was in danger, it would have, it would have bought the baby naturally. Do that. Yeah. But that's not really much sort of. And then I would to a mother trying to protect. But that. then I'd go. Yeah. Then I know that I could go on and have more children. So that would be all right. And I was like, what? I think the other thing as well is we did them. Um, asked them about you know chemotherapy. Obviously, I already knew that it's quite a toxic substance that you're right. taking. But but when we asked, uh, I can't remember if it was one of the nurses or something who dealt, you know, who deals dealt with all the chemotherapy side of things. She said, we asked, is it toxic to unborn? And she basically said, no, there's no, it won't harm your baby. And I was like, even then, you know, before I even researched it, I thought, I don't, don't sound right to me. You know, the <laughs> way she said, no, it's there's no harm in that whatsoever. We we um we quite jovi jovially. Oh my god, I can't speak. What's that word? <sighs> I don't know. Jovially. <laughs> Got chemo. You. It sounds like you've got chemo brains well, there. I've had no chemo. <laughs> what are you in at it? <laughs> anyway, we um we nicknamed her um chemo eyes because she came right up at me like and stared with the most intense right stare. in me with this most intense stare of chemotherapy is, is not dangerous. And I was like, I need to leave this room. This woman's <laughs> freaking me out. So wow. <laughs> anyway, so then um, so then we went home and just I, I always knew that I would never do chemo and radiation. And my my father had had um, 
had had cancer and I'd watched him have that treatment and I literally watched it take 20 years off of him. Yeah. Over, you know, he got so poorly and I just thought, why are you doing this to yourself? Yeah, I watched the same thing happen to my grandmom as well and it was it was just awful to see and it didn't take very long either. No, no and and it and it really is poison, you know, and you can see that your body is, you know, any, anyway. That's another another story, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And it's a personal choice as well. People have that choice, you yeah. know, it's a, and which which route that they take, but for me that was my personal opinion of Yeah. I just thought that that wasn't the route for me. Absolutely. Now, backing up a little bit to the testing procedures now, did they give you um, a biopsy? Yeah, they did. And now, unfortunately, at that time, I was very much at the mercy of them because I didn't really have my enlightenment until I kind of left that pre-assessment operate, uh, that assessment that I was telling you about where I kind of thought this is wrong. And then I went away and did so much research. But before that, I was kind of very much in their hands and I was kind of almost doing as I was told rather than realizing that actually I want to know what you're doing to me and and what is this procedure for and why, you know, before I was much more trusting, whereas now I'm, I know that I, you know, it's, it's wise to take your own choices and make your own informed choices. And had I known what I know now, I would never have had that biopsy but then I guess I would never have had the diagnosis either. But I think the thing that upset me was that when they did the biopsy, they also put titanium markers in the tumors. Right. So, That's what they do. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, I never really thought about it when they did it at the time. They never really asked me if they could do it. They just went ahead and did it. I guess because I was there, that was like pres- presumed consent perhaps. But for me, I guess I really never really thought too much about stuff like that. And had I of, I probably wouldn't have done that. Well, they kind of have a tendency to push you through the gates like chattel, you know, and, and they also, you know, they, they depend on your ignorance in order to push their, uh, I don't want to say agenda, but to push their products, to push their, you know, to, to push their knowledge onto you. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And I think a- the point of this whole video at the end of it all, if the viewer is trying to ascertain what it is, is basically for others to empower themselves and yeah. to know that there's other options available. But uh, yeah. sorry, moving along, though. Um, so after doing a bunch of research, I reckon it was around that time when you probably found Mary. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, that was kind of like, you know throughout this whole journey everything has been fateful I believe you know we were always destined to meet Mary I do believe that and you know it was just through chance through a client that Simon had but it wasn't chance I never believe in chance no I guess not you could see it as chance but actually Simon had a client that he had done some work for who had that link in with Mary right so um, we had spent some time well we when we told him what what had, had happened to us he came around and spent the evening and he told us about somebody that he knew that might be able to help so that was our route into finding mary um and then i did send probably a very long email to maybe three or four people that i'd been um given their contact details of oh, this person might be able to help you and bless i think mary was the only person that responded to me <laughs> oh wow but but then I was told Mary would probably not respond to me. So, you know, so I'm glad that she did respond to me, of course, very much so. Yeah. Um, but there you go. So it was all, I think it was just meant to be, you know. Right, right. Well, she is a busy lady and she does try to get back to yeah. as many people as she can. And, of course, you know, even given the circumstances, there's a high contingent of people who do try to waste her time. I, I mean, it's not uh, it's not anyone's fault. I mean, people are truly truly just looking for information, but uh, you know, she doesn't have <laughs> all the time in the world sometimes. But uh, no, it's it's brilliant that you guys were able to connect. And where where did it go from there? Was she? Um, so, so I sent an email, and then I think she may have sent an email back, or and then we'd had a phone call, and from then. From that phone call, um, she talked about how I needed to feel comfortable with her. She also needed to feel comfortable with me. She didn't want me to mess her around, and you know her time was precious, and she didn't like like you talk about. And yeah. you know she wanted to know that 
that I was going to, you know, work hard and um, take it seriously. Yeah, take it was, seriously, yeah, yeah. But yeah. she said it's a two, you know. I think, think Mary always said it's a two way thing. She goes, you know, it'd be good to us to meet because um, obviously, you know, Mary wanted to uh, to see us, and um, but she also said it'd be good for us to see it, see her, so that you get, you know, because you can pick up whether you instantaneously trust someone or like them, can't you? You know, um, yeah. She said, and if you don't trust me, vibe. then you shouldn't do this. Yeah, so yeah, that's right. You need to obviously have trust in your doctor, don't you? Or you know, uh, anyone that's trying to help you like that, you've got to have that faith in what they're that they're teaching you because otherwise you know you're not going to get anywhere very fast otherwise are you you know so no no so then, we, so then we went and met with her we went to um her house that um where she was staying at the time um and it was actually my birthday wasn't it i think yeah or the day before my birthday so we woke up on my, on my birthday, birthday having, <laughs> having met her and she said she'd said because it was my birthday she was going to get up and make me eggs bless her and she did <laughs> 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 but um but yeah no from that meeting we talked and talked about a lot really about the whole situation but, about... but, but before we even saw mary didn't she already already get a start a protocol for you before we'd even met her or did that come after i thought she started that before didn't she send one email that you I think maybe, maybe before we yeah. even met mary i think that she you know because she made contact with sarah she gave sarah already started her on a, said this is what you need to initially start you know the basic foundation but it, but it was a very very light one because i was pregnant you know and she, and actually she was the she was taken into account very much so that i was pregnant you know she didn't want to give me anything that she thought might harm the baby in any way or had or didn't know right whether or not would so therefore if she didn't know she wouldn't give it to me you so know? She, Im- immediately her focus of priority has already switched over to the well, the yeah, other life that was within Sarah. you i was, I was yeah. known as pregnant sarah you know and um <laughs> yeah even now i'm not pregnant i think she even refers to me as pregnant sarah <laughs> probably wow. i'll always be remembered as pregnant sarah <laughs> <laughs> wow so okay so now we're at the point I guess approximately where you're about to arrive to Mexico, and oh, well, no, no, no. We, before that, before that, mm-hmm. uh, the baby was born. Nell was born, our our youngest, um, and so we'd had a protocol when we came back from meeting Mary. That then I was very much on a protocol, and all the lifestyle changes kicked in, and I was super healthy, and I changed my diet. I looked after myself. I it was everything, wasn't it? It was physical. It was. Um... You know, there was the physical, you know, obviously Mary specializing, you could say, in all the physical side of all the different supplements and taking care of that, you know, make yourself so to exercise, do all that sort of stuff. But then Sarah was working on the, men- you know, any mental issues that she had from her past that she was withholding. I and- spent a lot of time with a counselor um, and really, really dug deep and, you know, really, really tried to get to the bottom of some of the demons that I'd been carrying around with for years um, I'd suffered from anxiety and depression for many, many years. And so, you know, this was almost like an opportunity to say, right, okay, you need to fix yourself or we're going to kill you. <laughs> oh, well, wow. well, it's one of the yeah. see, but you kill the cancer or the, the cancer, cancer is going to kill yeah, you. Yeah. This you was kind of like my last not... chance to actually, you know, just put everything, right. put everything into practice that I'd ever learned, you know, and go full throttle. So at that point, I went off work sick when I was diagnosed and I think I spent six months off sick. But at that time, I was having Reiki. I was going to counselling. I was um, doing fitness. I was learning about food again. I was doing, I was okay. just doing loads of food prep all the time. Yeah. And um, then, and then I went on maternity leave. And I think, and, and, the, and the other element as well, I think, which plays a big part, is the spiritual side of things uh, as well. Yeah, the absolutely. Final so um, I think you have to have. Yeah. I think it's almost like you have to almost get the balance for, with all all those sections. I think you have to take care physically. I think you have to take look look at any type of mental issue that may be creating problems within your body and spiritual. So there's a lot of people that just don't connect with the universe in any way whatsoever. You know, and this um, is true. Not one of them, but when you start to open yourself up to it, you you start to realise that it helps out there. You know, there's a lot of you start to get guided. You know, you feel like you're getting guided around. So you start to come across all sorts of amazing people, you know, and um, you start to, unco- you know, you start to find this knowledge that is all there. It's, it is there for everyone. It's just that people are so blinkered. They're too busy looking at their phones these days, aren't they? You know, looking at social networks. They don't see what's right in front of their face half the time, you know. This is true. Absolutely. It's almost like a like a learned, did- learned obsolescence for, you know, for. Uh, and, I, and for- I took things for granted and I yeah. learned not to. 
and it was a big learning curve and it was a scary one at times but it was it really was a gift it was a gift being diagnosed with cancer wow well th- that being said now um let's uh let's fast forward to where you're actually in mexico and okay. you're, you're you're getting your guts cleaned out doing the colonics and uh yeah. and, so when that it kind of i felt like it was my job to get Nell into the world safe and sound without any harm to her. So when she came, it was just incredible. It was such an incredible experience. And then we got her to three months, I think. Right. Yeah, she was three months when we went to Mexico. Um, we just wanted to get her strong enough so that she would be... Well, so her immune, her little well, immune system, yeah, you know, we wanted to for, give it a few months before we took her abroad. On the, pl- on the right. plane. And, Absolutely. You know, so. We got her to that point, and then it was kind of like, right, okay, everyone, it's time to sort me out. You know, it's to, I, I've I've done my bit sorting Nelly out and getting her into the world, and now it was my turn. So I was a bit apprehensive about going, but I was excited, and I thought, right, now we're going to step it up a bit. You know, we're going to start hitting my body with the stronger stuff, with the stuff that you know is really going to be beneficial. And I knew that it was going to. There was going to be a lot of work because I had a lot of um, amalgam fillings. I had root canals. I had um, I had infection in my mouth, so I had lots of dental work to correct. So that was, I think, I spent about thirty-five hours in a dentist chair in Mexico, wow. all in all. <laughs> wow, yeah, that, that was tough. But the most amazing dentist I've ever met in my life. She was incredible. Her name was Olivia, and. She had um, an assistant called Vanessa, and they were such an incredible, compassionate pair of people. And although we didn't speak one another's language very well, we kind of, she, you know. They, you got past it. Yeah, yeah, we did. We <laughs> you, found a way. You found, found a way to make it work, don't you? <laughs> and, you know, and I'll never forget. I will never. I've always hated dentists until then, always, which is really bizarre because I spent 35 hours in a chair with them yanking teeth out of my mouth <laughs> back to the clinic um, after one night. And it was like I'd been in a fight and everybody just took one look at me and they were like, get the doctor. She needs some pain medication. <laughs> That's stay. hilarious. Um, tears, but, um, but, it, but I knew, I knew that I had to go through all of that to, to heal. I knew that, um, a lot of that needed to be rectified and it was the same with the detoxing and the colonics and all the stuff that was uncomfortable and I think I was on cabbage soup for about a week and I was starving and I was like oh this is horrendous but you know I, I knew that I had to you know put that work in. Right. There's a lot of injections for it as well oh, because of all the so ozone treatment. And... and I don't like needles so that was really difficult <laughs> it was really difficult and I just had to suck it up but do you know what I would have taken that um, over having sitting in a chair and having chemo pumped into my body any day because I would have been so sick and I would have been so poorly. And it ever since, you know, um, all of the treatments that I've had, I have just got better and better and better and I've felt weller and I've felt fitter and I've felt stronger. So I've not had to feel sicker before I got well again. This is good. I've gone from strength to strength to strength, even though there were some painful procedures they didn't last very long and actually you know when I bounced back you know I, w- I was fitter stronger healthier than I'd ever been and you know I mentioned about having depression and anxiety I haven't suffered with that ever since I've been died so I haven't had a bout of that for over two years now um and that's incredible for me you know so that just goes to show me that there was an imbalance in my body yep. that was creating that depression and anxiety for me and once I addressed that and I healed those um, issues. I think it was a lot to do with guts. Um, you know, then, then, um, yeah. No, I mean, I mean, good mental health. Well, it, mental it, health it's a snowball it. effect, but it works both directions. Like, you know, you, you can get more depressed thinking about what a crappy situation you're in. You know what I mean? So it can snowball yeah. out of control in a it downward can. fashion. However, when you're built up and propped up by a good support system and by good old fashioned hard work, you can snowball upwards into a fantastic scenario. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. So I was just going to, I was just going to basically point out some key items for the listeners. And um, what we've, 
so far basically gone into was um, getting rid of uh, uh, bad dental work, um, like amalgam fillings, root canals. And just so that the listener is aware, the reason for this is so that we can remove any potential infections that your immune system is concentrating and focusing on mm -hmm. other than the other bad bits in your body. Yeah. Um, and we also... Well, Mention, Robert, that when they did the magnet treatments on me, they found 18 infections in my body. There you go. They were, they were like, wow, that's a lot of infection. I think that that was the most that they had found. And then when they retested me after they had done all of the um, at detox the end, well, treatments at the end, right? at, at at the the end, end of, of my stay, um, they every single one of those infections had healed. Well, they was aiming, I don't know what the aim was. 80% was well, good. Well, I don't know, yeah, 70 or 80%. 70, 80 they was, by the they time Sarah left, but she got 100 100%. So. Right. So that extra week waiting for that dental work was worth it. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, and then the other big thing also is about your um, ability to take in nutrients. And that's kind of where the colonics comes in. Um, yeah. How did you feel about all of that? Um, it was kind of, yeah. I've never really <laughs> done anything like that before. So it was kind of, you know, I was like, oh my God. But, you know, it was okay. You know, yeah. it was all right. It was like, I think it was seven just days. Do, it, was it? Just, it was just part of the process, I think. I just yeah. needed to just get on and do it, you know? Right on. So, okay. So you were there for 28 days, you said? Um, no, it was good four weeks, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah four weeks. Yeah, yeah. 28 days. Yeah. 28. Ah, okay, cool. And then, okay. So then let's just say you finished all of your business there in Mexico. You're headed back home. How did you find sticking to the protocol? Now, I guess you've already trained yourself uh, prior to leaving for Mexico. How, yeah, definitely. How did you, really, how did you find really it at, at home, though? No, I was fine. I was really strict before I went to Mexico. And actually, when I went to Mexico, they were offering me some foods that food groups that I didn't eat. And I was like, oh, wow. I, like, well, I didn't think I could this eat is, that. This so is you amazing. Was like, <laughs> I really did. I was like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> wow. So, um, you got to set the yeah. bar really low. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think I had probably, in fact, and actually maybe made myself a little miserable at times, but I had restricted myself too much. And it helped make me realize that actually there were certain things that I still could have. Um, so when I came home, I became a little bit more relaxed. I wasn't as rigid. Um, but I was still yeah, still very strict with it. I was so, still strict yeah. in what I had. I wouldn't, you know, yeah. I wouldn't deviate from the food. Well, stuff. the protocol that Mary set, you know, Sarah Rick, to be honest with you, she pretty much did stick to that like glue, really. I mean, right. you know, every day she'd be out for a well, no, about four times a week, wouldn't it? I mean, you still do it now, don't you? Yeah, I you know, go for run. a run, and um, you know, there was always the juice before you went off to because you obviously at some point you went back to work, so mm -hmm. you know, a juice would be made to take to work, and then at one. At that point, you know, Sarah would have to take all her own water and she would take her, you know, a lunch. She'd basically go off of like, you know, bag, <laughs> bags kitchen. full of like a, a mini and kitchen. All my, <laughs> and all my colleagues would take the mickey out of me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> work with you. And actually, some of those colleagues didn't really know of my personal circumstances. So I'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, just like to try and keep healthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but wouldn't it be a gobbuster if you actually uh, told them, eh? <laughs> you know, some people know. Um, and others don't. And I've always found it difficult to talk to people about it because people's response when you tell them, oh, I was diagnosed with cancer is that look of shock and horror. And it's just like, I don't really like doing that to people. <laughs> and, I, and I've never really liked to be in the center of attention. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to make a big thing out of it. So if the opportunity arises in the moment, you know, ha has presented itself for me to share that, of course I will. But um, I was saying to you before, Robert, that um, I would like to, um, in the next sort of six months, maybe in the next year, put together a website or a blog or um, or something where I can actually share my story. So, just if, to help other people, I think, absolutely, you know. to to support other people in a similar situation, just so they can realise that they've got choices. But you know, I mean. It's also about you know it would be selfish for me to keep all of this knowledge. Well, right? past, all the people that helped us, yeah, they've, yeah, they've obviously learned from other people, and it always gets passed down. And I think you know it'd be wrong for and you was, know Sarah to yeah. you know to have healed herself the way she's done it with all the help, and then not just share that you know put it out there so that other people can find it. Absolutely, you know, I mean it's like doing the interview with you. You know we're sharing. You know it, it's quite right because there's you know although there's you know there seems to be more and more people 
choosing what they could, you know, they term the alternative health system, which actually is the true health system. Really. Absolutely. You know, more and more people sort of going back and realizing it's the way to get sort of go but you know it's just um but it's interesting because in the mainstream uh, media which i don't really listen much to these days but um you know more and more is being talked about in terms of immunotherapy for cancer treatments yeah and I, oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> well here's a here's a weird thing that's a, it's a little bit it's not really off topic but it's it's definitely up our up our alley here though is that uh, the mainstream medicine by way of a few uh simple pieces of legislation they are trying to absorb this immunotherapy and kind of uh take it as their own they're trying to patent different uh yeah, exactly. technologies yeah. and what have you but they're doing the same yeah but they're doing the same as well aren't they with like you know they're doing because um you know cannabis is sort of like sort of legalizing all over the place and um people are using it to treat all sorts of ailments they're, they're, they're doing their own bit like monsanto and that are doing their own version of cannabis but i mean obviously it's genetically modified and it you know, it might. That's it's right. not going to really do a lot of good because it's obviously just going to be the same Frankenstein sort of product that they've <laughs> delivered with everything else. You know, so but they're definitely you know trying to you know get their arm in and push everybody else out of the way. You know, yeah. there's no doubt. About that. Well, but, the, 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 but, I was going to go ahead. The upside of that, you know, if it stops, if it creates a shift in this culture of treating people with cancer with radiation. Um, chemotherapy, surgery, then that's going to be a good thing. Even if they do want to make money out of it, it's still got to be a good thing because that's, in my opinion, almost putting people to their death. Yeah. You know, well, you know, you know this is a true, this is a true to life, uh, like it's a battle for our minds, and that, and that's kind of what it all is. It's all about uh, trying to shape our preference and our choices to uh, benefit another uh, entity, if you would. Now. Yeah. That that being said, um, offering people choices and waking them up, like I said, it's a very slow and gradual thing. It's not not too many people wake up instantly overnight. Like they have to constantly be beaten over the head with it. And <laughs> you know, it's it's true though because that's what they do. When I say they, I mean the mainstream media does that to us on a regular basis with every single avenue they have at their disposal. It, it's absolutely crazy. And yeah. we're just the small, weaker voices in a, in a larger crowd, you know. Um, and I really admire you for wanting to spread knowledge there, Sarah. That's that's absolutely amazing. And I'll, I'll back you up all the way. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, it's something I kind of promised the universe that I would do if, if, you know, I had a happy outcome. So, you know, I kind of, I kind of owe it. <laughs> well, well, this is where we get to the best part because we haven't really told people the outcome. Now you've had several tests since you've been back in, back in England. Um, what's the, uh, so, yeah, um, what's the so dealio there? In August I had, uh, well, I, I think I've had four results. Um, I did four Nagalase tests, um, which is where they look at, how much Nagalase is in my blood. And I understand that um, you have a higher Nagalase if you have any kind of infection. Um, so that I think that they use it for AIDS and for cancer and for autism. I'm thinking I do maybe. believe I'm so. Sure. They don't test it for autism, but it, it does. Autism does show higher Nagalase. Oh, okay. They don't test it. Anyway, I don't really understand the science part, but I, I know that that's a test that's used. And so um, we did two tests. We, uh, what, I can't remember when I first started testing, but we had four tests in total. Two of them came back, um, which were kind of quite high. They weren't high. They were just over. They were over the baseline, but well, the they were quite the low. You know, they were, was, the baseline was 28. You was at 41. Um, yeah, I was at 40 something. Which and is then, really low, really. But it showed that there was cancer in your system. Yeah. And then the next test result came back at... I think the first one was 41 and then the second one came back at 41 point something or other. I was like, oh, my gosh, it's not working. Um, and then I realized that I wasn't taking some of my protocol at the exact times of the day that I was supposed to. So I was like, oh, my God, how have I missed this? I was clumping certain products together so that they weren't working as they should. Right. So so that was something that I could quite easily fix. So I just made sure I stuck to the letter and to the time exactly of when I should be taking this stuff. And then the third test that came back, which was in August of last year, August 2017, um, the test result oh, yeah. came back at 26, which was below 
well, the base, the base, like the, the baseline, the baseline of twenty eight. The baseline of twenty eight. Anybody with twenty eight and lower basically don't have active cancer in their system. Obviously, if it goes above that, then it shows, you know, and how much higher it goes over it depends. That it shows how active it is within your body. So mm-hmm. Sarah had it in the previous two tests. They were. It showed that it was active, but it wasn't really high. And you know, and they stayed pretty much the same. And so I was we, testing every every three months, so that was three months before. So that so would that, have been sort of July. So that was no. Like, one, two, three. No, it was six months after. Yeah. So yeah, the third one showed that she went. We wasn't expecting. We was just aiming for it just to go down after we readjusted Sarah's protocol. I think it was about May. Right. We thought it should start to see it sort of like just gradually go down, you know. Um, but it had actually gone right down. It just. Like, it's like it just sort of like it just went right everything you know, just worked it, yeah it, it just, just went right under all of a sudden it just i got well and then well you was well and it, it was well well i was <laughs> well yeah yeah absolutely i was good i was feeling good um but you know you're all clear so i had my all clear clear in august and then three months after that we decided to do another test just to confirm just to make sure it wasn't an error or you know um so I was I was still taking a bit of a protocol. I've started to wean myself off of some of the products, the more expensive products, but some of the stuff that I've been taking, I even still take now because I just want to keep myself well and I just think I've learned all this knowledge and I know what all these things can do for me, so why would I stop taking them? The things that aren't relatively expensive I will always do those things. But they're yeah. the things that basically everybody, you know, all of us should take anyway, yeah. you know, like probiotic every day and vitamin, you know, getting, making sure vitamin you're vitamin D. vitamin D and vitamin C, you know, it's your basic vitamins and minerals really, which is what everybody's lacking, isn't it? You know, yeah. and, and working just, certain kinds of food into your diet as well. Definitely. Yeah. But I know all about the certain types of foods and I still juice every day because why wouldn't I, you know, I've got, I've got what I need to be able to juice, I know how to juice. It, it takes five minutes, not even that. So, you know, uh, these are this is just good practice now for me to always live this way. Um, yeah. And so then, yeah. So November, I had the second test results back, and um, oh, yeah, they they were they four. were they were sorry the fourth results back, and they were good results too. I meant the second good result. <laughs> right. So right. the second clear, yeah, that's that's what I meant. So that came back November and. What we'll probably do now is maybe another test in, say, six months, or and then after that, I'll probably just do once a year. You know, so, excellent. Yeah, right. but it's taken a while for me to actually have it sink in that I don't have cancer anymore. Well, um, it's, it's it's one hell of a hit, you know. Like it's it's kind of a it's a punch in the gut when you get when you get the news. I mean, yeah. y- your mind will race. You, you'll jump forward, you know, in your head and think, oh, what's going to happen, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. But you visualize it. I, I, this is something that I've always done whilst I was trying to get where I visualized the day that I was told, you know, it, it's gone. You you have the all clear, you know. So that was something that I just kept hold of. But it's just a weird transition going from thinking, you know, things might not work out. Well, you you was thinking, oh, you know, you know, I suppose it's all the things that I suppose we were thinking about. I think Sarah was thinking. I might not never see my fortieth birthday, or I might yeah. not see that. Like it's obviously our little girl's birthday tomorrow, and it's like um, Sarah's thinking I might not never get to see that. You know, back a couple of years ago when but, she was born, she was like thinking I may never get to see that. Uh, well, I also thought I would die in childbirth because I had <laughs> oh, a tumor yeah. in my brain and it might pop. Even though, I don't even know if that can happen. <laughs> but these are all the things. These are all the demons that you have to keep a check on. And actually. Yeah, I, I did have those negative days, but actually the 99% of the time I had to say to myself, you are well, you are cancer-free, you are good. You well, know, I yeah. had to make myself believe it because I think that, again, that is, part of the process. Yeah. that is part yeah. of the process of well, being well. That, that's, that's 50% of your immune system right there is your emotional level. I mean, without that, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you only got the other 50% to stand on, and if that's you know if that's riddled with infection and other bull you know other business then you're you know you're not doing so good you know that well, that emotional yeah. part is the most important yeah definitely i think you could um you know you could take the best sort of um you know um medicines products, in the yeah. products in the world but if you've got a real negative attitude to what you're doing then none of it's going to work yeah because exactly. think, you know the mind is certainly higher than the physical you know the physical side of things you know and if the mind you know i'm pretty sure i'm pretty certain that you could probably heal yourself just with your mind if you was that well you know that well tuned but you know yeah. what, but well, we're all human and we all have these doubts and some and it's important to not 
you, you, you've got to express it. It's, it's important. You know, I did a lot of work with a counsellor not to repress these emotions, not to repress it. So if you feel it is to let it out, but then to let it go, let it go, you know, and not not be defined by that, that and not mm. let that own you. Yeah. You know, so, you have to own it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, no, you know, definitely. I mean, I just think that, you know, your mind is definitely you could be your best friend or your worst enemy. You know, and that, and you've just got to make sure that you've got it as your best friend. And you just have to feel empowered, really, that you know you have the ability to do it. You know, you 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 have an amazing body. You know that that does amazing, amazing things. You know, my body. Thank you. <laughs> a baby inside of it, whilst it had cancer in it. You know, and that's an amazing thing. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, what would you suggest to uh, anybody in a similar situation as your as your own? I think that the biggest thing I would suggest is to not be led by fear, you know, so don't make any decisions when you're fearful. I think you need to realize that you have time. You were, you know, if, even if you're diagnosed with cancer, you're not going to die the very next day from that diagnosis. You even have, if the doctors, well, the, you know, yeah, the doctors the doctor, tell you that. Well, they will if you tell believe you, it, then you might. But, but yeah, you know, that's, also, that's yeah. another thing, you know, you, you shouldn't Just believe. don't take anybody's word for it. I, I basically, you yeah. know, on, on either side, you know, get, you know, get the people's opinion, but then go and research it because the information's out there and then go and see, you know, and if you can find that confirmed by several other, you know, doctors confirming the same thing, and I'm not just talking about mainstream doctors, I'm talking about doctors on the other side of the spectrum as well. Then you know, then you know that you know they're telling you the truth. You know, there's always ways to check a check system. You know, we checked everything out. You know, the the pros and cons of everything. You know, before any decision was made. You know, but it's right. also about following your gut feeling. You know, you have to really be in tune with how you're feeling about what people are suggesting for you. You know, and you have to remember that you are the decision maker. As an adult, you decide what happens, and you have to live with the decision of that or the consequence of that whatever decision you make, you know, so if you take the alternative route or if you take the conventional route, you have to live with the consequences of what that's going to do to you. You have to, and and I think that it's important to make informed decisions. It's really important to, to know the detail about what might happen or what would be the side effects of this, that, and the other treatment. It's, and, and one of my favorite quotes from a doctor um, on the truth about cancer, the truth about cancer is great. It's so informative. There's so many different doctors on there that with lots of d- really valuable advice. Um, and I think the doctor was called Dr. Garston. And he talked about how it's a doctor's role to empower the patient to get well, not to fix the patient. So, you know, a doctor doesn't heal somebody. A person heals themselves with the knowledge that the doctor gives them. You know, it's yeah. about being empowered and that resonated with me and I was like absolutely you know so I mean I've had some wonderful people around me include um, and Mary has been fantastic and she has been just, you know I cannot thank Mary enough for what she has done for me and my family but you know and, and she's given me the knowledge that I needed but I've had to do it for myself you know she's absolutely. given me I've needed but I've had to do it for myself I've not given the power over to anybody and said oh no I'm a victim help me I'm poorly fix me I've gone do you know what take responsibility, take responsibility. Even, even in the dentist chair <laughs> absolutely you know I, was, I had this like well, I had this they put well, like a blanket over my head <laughs> there, there used to be a day there was a time when your dentist used to do it all the dentist was also your surgeon and also your psychiatrist <laughs> <laughs> And your pharmacy. I mean, but, you know, that was like, what, in the 1800s now? <laughs> uh, we've come a long way since then. Unfortunately, we've also become a busier, busier world. And uh, there's a lot of other powers that are driven by money. And, you know, yeah. the, 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 sense of, the sense of health care has kind of gone away from the care side of things. I and think that- it's... I don't think well, it's, it's health care, it's, isn't it? I it's, think it really it's is. sick it's care. It's sick care. It's care for sick people. Correct. I think um, when you look at you know, mainstream medicine, I think it's brilliant when it comes to things like fixing people with, um, you know, operations on fixing people, broken arms, broken bones, you know, heart, opera- you know, all this sort of stuff. Yeah. They're, you know, absolutely amazing. But then, you know, you can see that the reason why all that stuff developed because there's money in, you know, if they're de- you know, if they're um, developing, you know, um, plates to put in your body and all the rest of it, you can understand 
why it would be advancing in a positive way because that's where they make their money from helping people in a positive way but with um i think you know with illnesses it's different because chronic there's, disease you yeah. know uh, an illness if, if you can cure everybody of cancer you know um you wipe you know, out in an entire actual way industry. then there, there yeah. is no industry there's no business yeah. model and it's yeah. a massive bit and it, you know and it is true it's a massive they just so hundreds of billions of pounds you know on a cancer treatment and then you look at the statistics you know and when we you know when you go and check out the actual true survival rate it's like two percent yeah you know 98 percent of people die from their cancer treatment you know they don't even die yeah. from the actual cancer they actually die from the chemotherapy that's the true radiation. and most people that survive their their chemotherapy and you know well sorry their cancer and subsequent chemotherapy most of these people would have survived the cancer anyway statistically speaking yeah I, I, yeah, no, and that's true. You know, their body would have probably gone through. And we, you know, I mean, I think, you know, that's something we say about your dad because there was a point where he just said, I've had enough of this now. And yeah. He just basically said, I don't doing it. And then he, just, he lived anyway, you know. So it was yeah. like, I just think that was in spite of everything they'd done to him. He survived that because I think he just had enough and he was like, well, I'm just not going to put up with this now. I'm just going to survive anyway. And, and, he it's, did. and sometimes being a little pissed off at your doctor, that gives you the gumption to, to you know, that might improve your immune system. You know, that, that <laughs> flight or flight survival <laughs> sense, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. I think the other thing as well, um, what you notice is that everybody in the, you know, the mainstream healthcare system are victims. It's such a victim mentality that they put you in. I'm a victim and we're going to heal you. You know, I'm a victim. Whereas in the alternative, it's not, you're not a victim. Just pull your boots up, look out there and get on and heal yourself. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. a totally different mentality, you know, and it's a, it's an empowering and enlightening one, you know, whereas when you're in, um, you know, mainstream, it's very depressing and you feel like you have no, and you're waiting for these people to cure you, which, you know, in a lot of cases, unfortunately they don't. Yeah. And there's a lot of, clinical, there's a lot of clinical arrogance around, you know, um, people that, I don't know that I, I I don't know I don't know I don't know if they got into medicine and their intentions were great but you know somewhere well, they've been along indo- the lines I think they- a lot of doctors' intentions are <coughs> for the right reason but they've been indoctrinated into a system and compartmentalized is, yeah, absolutely yeah. and they don't realise that a lot of what's going on on the outside and, of it and they've been told that that's all nonsense that was proved nonsense like fifty the, years ago and you the know? surgeon that I saw I asked him at the time have you ever had anybody heal themselves from cancer using alternative treatments and he looked at me and he went no and we kind of came out of that and I said what do you think of what he said and Simon said I think he's lying personally but um it's funny because they um, they called me quite recently actually to catch up with me. How how was I doing? And well, I, they probably was expecting to speak to me and me to turn around and say, "Oh, oh she, she died." She died. <laughs> but anyway, I turned around and I said, "You can tell your surgeon that now he does have somebody that's healed themselves." No, you said to him at the time, <laughs> yeah. "I'll be the first then." I, I did. I, did. I, was, I was a bit arrogant right back at him, you know, because I just thought, you know, how dare you? Uh, you know, it's like he's just saying. But then again, that way, was that, no that was that arrogance of. Well, no. That, I'm the expert. I'm the expert you know? in this field. You don't know anything. Oh, You're I've re- just- I've read peer-reviewed journals and blah 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 and. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of yeah. Course. Yeah. Exactly, and, that, and that's the thing. But the thing is, so have we now. You know, that's the, that's the thing. And all the research that you know, as time's gone on, done a hell of a lot of reading by a hell of a lot of doctors. You know, and you, you'd be amazed that you know, like the doc, the people that won Nobel prizes up until you know the, this. Um, you know, the, the, the industry that's around now in the medical system, everything was like natural. Now, all the people that won all Nobel Prize, you know, all the all the pri- were all doctors practicing like natural medicine until it got taken over by you know the Rockefeller Foundation and all the rest of them pushing all their petrochemical yes, stuff. Yes, you know, and, and the pharmaceutical industry. You know, and they just took it over and they put everybody else out of business and took it over and made it their own, you know, and siphoned all the money into their own bank accounts. And the guy who who um, who did some research into oxygen, oxygen therapy, he won a Nobel Peace Prize, um, you know, and how he stated that um, cancer cannot thrive in an oxygenated environment. And so when I said to the surgeon, um, who I was under his care at that time, because it was very, very early, early days, even though they didn't give me any care, we just had a couple of meetings, I asked him to sign a form. Well, you had to get a doctor. I needed to sign a, it, I needed a doctor to sign a form for um, for it was actually a, an MS center um, where they did oxygen therapy, but right. you needed to have a medical form signed to say that that was okay. You could have oxygen therapy. So he said to me at the time, "Can you sign my form? I want some oxygen therapy." He said, he said um, 
well, I don't know anything about ocean therapy. I don't know if it's beneficial or if it's not, but I will sign your form. <laughs> oh, good, good on you. <laughs> good, good, good. I, like, I, I don't really care okay, what no. your opinion is. Yeah, I, I just want my form signed. Yeah. But when I went away and thought about it, I thought, how irresponsible of you to not know this, to not but, have read that well, research yeah. or read the book or even know anything about the benefits of oxygen therapy. But I thought that um, doctors anyway generally would have known that because, it, it, you know, oxygen therapy, obviously they use it for MS and, you know, maybe not so much unless you're in the know with, when it comes to cancer. But th certainly when you have serious wounds and injuries or a lot of sports people who have injuries, you know, they, they get sent to oxygen to help their wounds heal faster. Yes. Yeah. You know, footballers who, um, you know, who are making all the money for their football club, you know, and turn over millions of pounds, you know, they want them to heal pretty fast you know so that's what they do they send them to oxygen um tamers for their wounds to heal quick you know and it's like how did they, you know a lot of doctors know this so I, when he was saying that i could you know again i couldn't believe that he isn't aware that oxygen's good you know i mean we need oxygen to survive <laughs> I, i've i've seen some uh i've seen some younger traditional doctors especially when i was in, when i was in mexico there i saw one or two just absolutely lose their mind and run across the room when they saw an empty syringe being injected into someone's bloodstream. Now, this is ozone therapy, and yeah. it works. It's fine. There's no, there's no danger whatsoever. That. But it just yeah. didn't make sense in their rational in their <laughs> rational brain. It just made no sense at all. Yeah, yeah. And that is, and based on those facts, I think that is why you shouldn't one hundred percent. Well, you shouldn't put your trust and hand your health over to a doctor who has only had a set amount of training on this this and this that's you right. know but the majority of them haven't had any training on nutrition and that's the foundation of good health well it goes right Crazy. back it's 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 kind of ironic because you know these people swear the hippocratic oath yet it was hippocrates who said let food be thy medicine so it's yeah. it's yeah. funny yeah, it's exactly. a perfect example of how whole, but yeah. the whole do no harm nonsense yeah, yeah. absolutely <laughs> Yeah, no, that's definitely, that's definitely right. And it is the foundation. I mean, you know, you can take your, you know, as part of Sarah's protocol, obviously when you have a serious illness, like you have to take supplements, but really you need to, the most important thing is foundation is to get your diet right first. And that's yes. that. Everything's built up from that, you know, and obviously, you know, for a general people every day, your health's pretty good, you know, that's all you need. Just keep yourself really healthy, do exercise yeah. and a really good diet. Yeah. You know, you need to take all these extra, you know, the supplements that if you start to get a specific disease and you're lacking in certain things and yeah. yeah you need to push them up you know obviously you need to over you know push them up quite high to kill off the body that's in your system you know yeah. so it's like vitamin d3 i mean you guys you guys live in england it doesn't get sunny there often <laughs> that's right <laughs> so you might need to supplement your vitamin d3 intake that way yeah, but definitely. um and i mean that's the only time supplements should really be taken is in in the absence of a naturally occurring uh, thing that's that you true. need yeah. 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 Which is interesting because when I was pregnant, they said that my iron levels were down and I needed to take some folic acid. And I didn't realize that folic acid is the synthetic um, version synthetic of vitamin C, isn't it? Of folate, I think it is. I think they call it something. Um, I can't remember what it's called, folate or something like that. But anyway. I, I can't remember what it is myself. <laughs> it's, it's iron, it's in spinach, you know, so there are lots of food groups that you can start eating more of to up, you know, up your levels. Yes. So I I, um, I took my packet of um, folic acid and then I just went home and ate lots more spinach. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I did just fine, I did just fine. Naturally. Well, uh, that's been about an hour now. I guess we can uh, pretty much uh, call her there. Um yeah. Uh, is there anything you guys would like to add in closing? Um, so, I don't know. I'd just say to anybody that's out there, you know, I mean, it's, you know, the most important thing is just don't believe. You know, everybody, I think in society is general, you, you know, everybody's sort of put into the, you're, you're basically told that there's, there's your reality. This is the box and this is the reality that we've created for you. You know, the, all the media, everybody that surrounds you. And you realize that and they tell you that anything's outside of that box. That's where all the crazy people hang out. You know, I mean, all the conspiracy theorists and all the wacky people, all the people that smoke loads of weed, they all live in this outside. But that actually is the reality. The box that they're trying to keep you in is the non-reality, you know, and that that really is the truth. The world is upside down. 
and um, you know, just in as bad as it sounds, just look out because you start to realise that that's where the truth is lying, and they desperately don't want people finding to be able to heal themselves. You know, yeah, yeah taking empowering themselves because heaven help these, uh, you know, the like they call them the one percenters. If everybody started to empower themselves, then they would be in real trouble, wouldn't they? You know, absolutely. And, and for me, I think it's really, really important. Um, once you've made your decision of what route you're going to go down and you're committed, um, it's important to surround yourself with people that support you. It's really important that you have a good support network. And if people don't support you and they're putting doubt in your mind, then you take a sidestep from yeah, those people. Get rid of them. <laughs> and my, absolutely. Yeah, and, and you need to put yourself first and you need to sort of sever ties with certain relationships and then maybe when you're well, you can revisit them. You know, I don't mean to cut these people out of your life forever, but I that's think right. you, have, you have to really concentrate on you because that's, I think, one of the messages from cancer, you know, of it. you need to concentrate on you. You need to stop thinking about everybody else and you need to start healing you and putting yourself first. Yeah, and I you think- know something, and, and having said that, um, you know, leading from the front is very important. And to be an example, instead of trying to change other people's opinions and minds, just do it yourself. And, you know, the proof is in the pudding, as they say, and others will definitely see it and maybe reconsider their own actions. You know, I, yeah, I, always, I always wanted to inspire people. And um, just having gone through this experience, I know that I've inspired s- several people to, to start living differently or doing different things or you know, many people have come to me and said, if I were to ever get cancer, I'm coming straight to you. Um, I want to know everything that you know. Um, you know, and, and that that's really been quite touching, you know, that um, that I've made an impact, you know, for yeah. people. So well, that's I just good. hope you can continue to do that. That's great. It's like Michael Jackson said, you got to start with the man or woman in the mirror. That's <laughs> <laughs> the mirror. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> I yeah, listen to all my right. runs. I like a bit of Michael Jackson when I'm running. <laughs> Very inspiring stuff. Uh, it's totally true, you know. It's totally true. All right, guys. Well, I won't let you uh, go on too late here. It must be pretty late there, 8 or 9 o'clock at least. No, 20 it's past 10. 20 but past that's 10, all right. that's, that's not too bad for it's us. 20 past time. 10, eh? <laughs> Yeah. You. Right. Well, <laughs> I just want to thank you guys as always. It's been a pleasure to speak with you and uh you're always you're always in a good mood every time I talk to you or see you guys. Uh that's because we're talking to you, Robert, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, no, it's good to talk to you. It's as been well. a pleasure, Robert. Thanks for um the time you've put into doing this. I appreciate it. Hey, yeah. anytime I can make my gear work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Sarah, I have to send you some pictures then, isn't it? I, I think. will do, yeah. Yeah, and then I can put that into the video, and uh, this should be up online within the next few days. i got to do the audio mastering and build the video file, but I'll also group it up with, I'll, I'll put links to the other videos that you did while you were down in Mexico with us, and that way the listeners will have full story. And, yeah. and when I actually get around to, you know, making this website um, of mine, um, you know, I can send you links and stuff, and hopefully you can add those or just point people in that direction. Oh, absolutely! I'll I'll I'll, I'll stand I'll stand behind you on that one hundred percent because I'm all about it. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. All right, well, thank you guys, and uh, I guess with that, I'll let you go, and uh, I'll uh, I'll record an outro separately. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, no, yeah, no, whatever you want to do, mate. That's cool. Thanks, right. Robert. It's been lovely chatting to you. Hopefully, speak to you again at some point. Yeah, no, maybe. no, definitely. I look forward to it. Okay, you if guys you have. Ever, a... If you ever want to come to England, you're more than welcome to visit. <laughs> well, I'm gonna have to make some money, but yeah, I, I, I would like to. <laughs> <laughs> One day, eh? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, you have a you have a lovely night. And yeah, you, and, well, and you. So, what time is it there? Oh, it's about. It's only five twenty in the in the afternoon now. All oh, right. Oh, we have a good evening. Yeah. Well, Well, thank you. you. Good late afternoon then. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) Okay, thanks, guys. You have a great night. Bye. Take care. See you. Bye Bye now.